see you all today. Glad you could be with us here. And if you are joining us online, welcome to you as well. And uh, we'll be having communion a little bit later in the service. So if you can find some bread and juice or wine to um, have that ready to participate a little, little bit later when we come to the Lord's table. So we continue today thinking about the cross and what the cross shows, and what the cross does and uh, we're in that season of the year when our thoughts move in that direction, given that Easter is approaching rather quickly, although you couldn't necessarily tell given the weather today. We've had spring, we've had summer, we've had winter all in, what, a week? Um, pretty much a three-season week for us, so here we go. But anyway, it's good to be together to worship the Lord today, and uh, a privilege that we do not take lightly, do not take for granted. So... Let's look to the Lord now as we embark on this time of worship. God, you're so good, and we're grateful for your kindness and love for the consistency of your grace and care. As we come together today for this uh, time of worship, we ask, Lord, that you'd help us to sense your presence. We thank you that we can join with the many in our area, around the nation, and across the world that are worshiping you. And we're remembering, too, that this is a day, this is a time of, that for some is really difficult to get together and worship. And so we pray for sisters and brothers, especially in places where there are pressures on them and due to circumstances around them, that you would encourage their hearts and keep drawing them close to you. We're glad that you're here with us, Lord. We pray for your blessing on our time together and commit it to you in Christ's name. Amen. It's amazing love, so please stand and sing and lift your voices in, in praise to our amazing God. One, two, three, four. <laughs>
wonders beyond our galaxy. You're holy, precious Lord. Precious Lord, reveal your heart to me. Father, holy, hold me. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy.
Lord, all around us there is reference to so many ways we can direct our attention and our energy. So many options, so many possibilities. And to say that there's nothing better than you is a real move of faith. To believe that you're the one we need, that you're the most important part of life. So would you help us to walk into that, to believe that, to live like it's true, to live like you're real, that you matter, that you matter more than anything. Thanks, God, that you accept us as we are. You accept us as we come. You welcome us into your presence. Thanks that you encourage us to pray. And God, we keep lifting before you people we care about, situations that tug at our hearts. Please, God, be at work to bring peace push back against evil. To heal. To provide. To bring wisdom. Reunion. Understanding. Help us walk through our days with you, with our eyes on you. Praise be your holy name. Amen. Please have a seat. And if you would find a Bible, either one you brought with you or one of the Bibles that's in the pew, if you use the pew Bible, we're going to look at Colossians chapter 1. In the blue pew Bible, it's page 1676, and there's a really dense passage that the Apostle Paul sends to these folks in Colossae that um, I'm going to read for us and have you follow along because there's a lot packed into this small handful of verses. Page 1676 Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 15, in light of what we're talking about this month, which is the cross of Jesus, what it shows, what it demonstrates. So here's what Paul says about the Son, and he's, mentioned, he's referencing very clearly Jesus. The Son is the image of the invisible God, firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, Thrones, powers, rulers, or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So it's, he's saying a lot about Jesus here. He's before everything. He's made everything. Everything holds together in him. He is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning. He's the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. No one is better than you. Just to, to say it in another way. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. There it is, that reference to the cross. Peace through his blood shed on the cross that brings about reconciliation. Reconciliation in this case means this idea of bringing close what has been separated 
making right what has been broken. And that's what Paul is wanting to um, say about Jesus. And that's the part of this passage we're going to think about this morning. There's a lot in here that we could go to, but we're going to focus on that idea of reconciling to himself all things. In the Bible, the story is told that sin comes into the good creation that God has made and has a disruptive force on this creation. Chaos emerges that hadn't been there before. There is upset in the lives of individuals, individ as people and in connection with other people. There's all kinds of trouble. And then there is this distance between people and God. All of these things happen because of sin. And that is a problem. But then the story goes on to tell us that God sends Jesus to take care of this problem. God made people to be in a relationship with them. They turn away from him. They kind of say, yeah, I understand, but no, I'm not interested. And you might expect that God would say, fine, I've given you all this. You don't want it? No, we're done. Maybe you've had an experience like that, someone that you have tried to be kind to and they just look at you and insult you or walk away from you or in some way just say, forget it. And that tendency that wells up inside of us to say, fine, two can play this game. But this is not God's game. God doesn't turn away. Rather, he's <laughs> he moves towards. He steps in. He pours out. And the cross is a good example of that. At the cross, the power of sin is overcome. Its effects are neutralized. And Paul will use the language of rescue and restoration. That's possible because of the cross. The word we're seeing this morning is reconciliation. It's actually a word that Paul uh, makes up. He creates it out of a couple of other Greek words. We don't find it hardly anywhere else other than in our New Testament. And Paul will use it when he writes to the Romans and to the Ephesians and to the Corinthians and to these people here in Colossae. Because he wants to stress this idea of what God has done. There's this gap, there's this distance, there's this brokenness, and God moves to fix that. That's the reconciliation that Paul wants to reference here. So he uses a new word, but it's not a new idea. We hear this idea expressed in other places of our scripture. So for instance, in a story that Jesus tells, a story that maybe you've heard before, uh, a story about a father and two sons, and how these two sons are there with the father and they decide, um, well, actually one of them decides that he has had enough of life in his dad's place. And so he comes to dad and says, hey, I want my inheritance right now and I'm out of here. He's the younger son. Of course, the, you know, the younger sons are always the hotheads, the firstborn. They, they stick around, they're responsible and you know, they, they stay. But no, the younger kid, he goes off. So he gets what his dad gives him and off he goes to a far country. He is gone. All right? He will <coughs> run through all of his resources. And finally, Jesus says, when he's telling the story, he'll come to his senses. And he thinks, what am I doing? I could go back home and I could hire on with my dad and have a much better life than I'm having right now. That's it. I'll do that. Let's go home. Not so much to, you know, get back with a guy who loves me and cares about me, but rather because I need to take care of myself somehow. And right now it's not working so well. So off he goes. Goes back home. He's got this speech rehearsed. Father, I've sinned against you. I've sinned, against, you know, I've just, I've blown it. And uh, would you hire me on? You know, I'll work minimum wage. Plus, maybe just a little bit. Um, you know, would you take me on? So he comes back home and uh, Jesus, as he's telling the story, says that the father sees him while he's still far away, and the father runs out to him. Now, in that culture, this is kind of an interesting move because um, fathers really didn't run. Older people didn't run, especially towards younger people. You know, it's supposed to be younger. We're honoring the older. This is a reversal of that. The old guy, you know, you just imagine your mind, right? He's kind of down the path. 
and the son comes, you know, and he's got this speech already prepared, but the father just grabs him, embraces him, kisses him, and says, you know, here, you're here, and the boy, you know, kind of pulls back a little bit and says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I, but he doesn't get to finish his story. The father just says, hey, just no, stop it. Come on inside. We're going to have a party. You're back. This is great. So the fatted calf is slaughtered, the party ensues, and there's so much commotion in the house that the older brother hears about it. He's out in the field. We don't know exactly what he's doing out in the field, but he's out in the field. The older brother who has stayed, who has been responsible, who has stayed there. Here's the commotion. Goes towards the house, asks one of the servants, what's happening? Your brother has returned. Your father has slain the fatted calf. There's a party going on. And the older brother thinks, this is great. Finally, this kid is coming back. Now we're all together again. Won't this be wonderful? Except that's not what he does at all. He just sits out there and, you know, just fist clenched, scowl on his face. Completely. Completely miserable. And then something else that Jesus says. The father now goes out to him. The father had run to the younger son. Now the father goes out to the older son. Again, he goes out. He comes to the son and says, what's up? This kid, this son of yours, not my brother, this son of yours. He goes off, he squanders all the money. He comes back, you throw him a party. What is that? I have been here slaving all my life. I have been the good son. I have taken care of business. And I never even had a goat. He too apparently has a speech planned. He's been keeping this one for a while for just the right moment. And this is it, except that, you know, once more the father kind of cuts him off and says, wait a minute. I'm adding here a little bit. If you want to read the actual story, um, it's in Luke 15, but all that I have, the Father says, is yours. You had access at any point. Now, what's great about this story with Jesus is it doesn't really um, wrap everything up in a nice, neat bow. It's not a Hallmark story, right, where everything is tied off and you're done. It's just open-ended. Because what Jesus is trying to show here is that, well, a couple of things. One is um, there are all kinds of ways to leave. Right? You can just go. You can turn your back and go and try and go as far as you can. You can stay, you know, like the older brother did, who stayed at the house but really didn't share his dad's heart. He had left, even if physically he was present. I mean, the rest of him wasn't there. Different ways to leave. But... Jesus isn't interested so much in the ways you leave. He's wanting to emphasize how this father behaves. He goes, he goes, he welcomes, he invites, he throws a party. He doesn't hold on to this with resentment when the younger kid comes and says, okay, fine, um, now we got to talk. Now we got to work this out. We have arrangements to make before you can come back in. We have to reestablish trust or whatever it might be. There's none of that. It's just come. It's the same type of idea with the older brother. There's just this welcoming, this availability that starts with the father's initiative of going to them. It's reconciliation described in a different way. There's a problem. The problem gets solved by, in Paul's case, when he talks about it in Colossians, by God sending Jesus to die on the cross. In Jesus' story, it's the Father who reconciles, who makes it possible to restore what was broken in that relationship. The distance of these two boys in Jesus' story, the distance is of their own making, the repair of the distance, the closing of the gap, that's the Father's deal. When we get hold of this idea of reconciliation, whether it's through teaching that Paul gives or through a story that Jesus tells, when we get hold of this idea of what God has done, what God offers, what God makes possible, we start to change the way we 
process things, the way we look at life. And that's exactly what Jesus and Paul and those with them are going for, right? They're wanting to show this reality of God stepping in to close the gap, to fix the problem, to help people understand that everybody, anyone who's left, for whatever reason, they're all welcome back. There's an invitation for any of them, for all of them to come. There's room. There's plenty of room. And there's a party going on that each one is invited to. When you get hold of this idea of what God is like and what God makes possible, a couple of things are, are meant to happen. One is it reorients the way we think about ourselves and about God that we are valued by God, that God is willing to do this. That's a powerful shift in thinking. But we don't stop there because as Paul will go on to say, and Jesus, of course, does the same type of thing. As we come back into this relationship, as we re-enter kind of where we started, but as we're back with God, our life now takes on the character of God this one who reconciled, this one who draws close, this one who's welcoming others, we start to imitate that and we want to be like that. We follow his lead, if you will. That's the basis for so much of the teaching about the Christian life that we find in scripture. It's not all these rules given to us to make our life difficult or somehow um, <laughs> less interesting than our friends and neighbors. These instructions are there to help us consider what God is like and what a good life entails. We find ourselves coming into the presence of God and wanting not only what God offers, but also to be what God, what God is like, to be how God is. is. Which brings me here. Here's the transition. When the scriptures describe the supper that Jesus had with his friends, you'll remember from things you've heard around communion how sometimes the communion is introduced on the night he was betrayed. He met with his disciples. And if we ponder that comment about the night he was betrayed, why do we say that? Why, why does the scripture say that? What betrayal is the scripture talking about there? Yeah, it's Judas handing Jesus over to the soldiers, right? And when Jesus gathers in that room for that meal, where is Judas? Judas? as they gather together for that meal? He's there at the table, all right? And it's not just Judas at the table, but you have other disciples at the table. Uh, you have a guy named Peter who's at the table, who in a matter of hours when he's asked, do you know Jesus will say, I do not. Thank you very much, leave me alone. And all the rest of the disciples who will, upon Jesus' arrest, who will go, they will scatter like cockroaches when the light turns on in the kitchen. I hope you've never had a kitchen like that. We did once when we were young. It was just really grim. Anyway, that's the picture. The meal that they're having is Jesus at the table with these guys, one of whom is going to hand him over, the rest of whom are out. They're gone in just a matter of hours. And Jesus says, come to the table. Let's eat together. That's a powerful moment. And here at this table, he is taking them back to an event in the life of the nation where God had rescued people from Egypt. And that was being depicted in what was going on at the table. And he is taking them forward to the cross itself, 
which will be a rescue of an entirely um, greater character. It's a couple of orders of magnitude greater than the exodus from Egypt. And he will do that with people <laughs> that are about to turn and run. It's a picture of God saying, hey, come, come. That meal will not be the last time that those disciples are, are around a table. This will become for them an event that happens on a regular basis when they gather together to worship the Lord, to remember the Lord. They will sit at that table, they will eat bread and drink wine and remember the Lord who died for them, who went to the cross so that they could be reconciled. When we come to this table, we're the same ones, we're the same people, right? There was a time in our lives when we were turned away from God. But there's this invitation from God, this God who seeks, this God who welcomes, this God who invites, who says, come. When we come to this table, we come to remember the Lord, the Lord who died, the Lord who died so that we could be reconciled, so that we could be drawn in close. And so today, as we eat and drink, let's do that, mindful of the reconciliation that God has made possible, of the relationship that God wants to have with us, of the way that affects and shapes and gives a sense of direction to our lives. We're going to take a quiet moment to thank the Lord for what has happened that's commemorated here at the table. We're going to also pause to uh, just acknowledge ways that we have recently slipped, turned, uh, grown indifferent. And then we will eat and drink together in memory of the Lord. So let's pray. bringing first our confession for what we've done, for what we've left undone. These we acknowledge before you, Lord. And we pray your forgiveness through Christ. We seek your help and strength to live in ways that honor you. And we bring our thanks that you're a God who doesn't hold a grudge, that you're a God who doesn't just walk away in a huff. You're a God who reaches out. You're a God who invites, who welcomes in. A God who keeps giving. We look at this bread and cup and see the evidence here of love and grace. The picture here of reconciliation. Praise be to your holy name. Amen. Jesus took bread and broke it. He gave thanks. He passed the bread around among his disciples and said, my body's been broken for you. As you eat this, remember me. He took a cup, asked his disciples to see in this cup his blood of the covenant, a promise that God had made that would be for their good because the estrangement was over, the relationship could be restored 
through Jesus' death on the cross. And so as we drink, we remember and give thanks. You are great and you are good, and we thank you for how you care for us, for the way that you welcome us, the way you've opened a door for all to walk through. Praise be to your holy name. God, help us live in this freedom. Help us to keep taking on more and more of your character, we pray. Amen. Running after, it's running after me. Your good. 
of the goodness of God. I will sing. I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you are, all that you've done, and all that you're continuing to do here in our midst. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Good morning. Uh, my name is Missy Schmidt. I'm an elder here at St. Thomas, and I have the announcements for this Sunday, March 27th. Um, today's the last day to order flowers for the sanctuary for Easter. If you'd like to do that, please use this form, which is out in the foyer, to um, order. You can order Easter lilies or tulips. 
Um, on Wednesday, we have an exciting event happening. Hopefully the weather, we will say an extra prayer this morning. Um, stop by for the Fire Pit Fellowship this Wednesday um, at 7 p.m. There's going to be live music from Erica Lynn Everest Duo. Um, we're going to have good food, games, hot dogs, s'mores, um, lots of great fellowship and conversation. So bring a chair, invite a friend, everybody. We're going to have probably even more than one um, fire pit because we're expecting a lot of people. So please come and join us. Um, Tickets and posters to advertise a chicken barbecue, which is on April 9th, will be available after the service. I think you can probably see Connie for any of that information. And next Sunday, we'll have a single service at 930 as the choir sings Once Upon a Tree, which is this year's Easter cantata. Thank you. So this idea of reconciliation is one that Paul really likes. Uh, let me read a couple of verses from another place where he talks about it. He says, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Which is pretty astonishing, right? As we have been welcomed in, God says, now you make sure that message gets out so people hear that. Because they're, they're welcome as well. The door is open. So, as we go into whatever it is, awaits us, may it be with an understanding that God has welcomed us in. God loves us. But God's love is not restricted to just us. God loves all the people you're going to meet today and tomorrow and the next couple of days. And past that. And we get the opportunity to share that message in different kinds of ways so that people can hear, people can find, people can walk back in as God wills. Let's be those people, okay? Amen. Lord bless you.